This is Keys to the Shop, episode 382, Home Brewing, Hospitality, and the Birth of a Brewer, with Osgush Jerdan and Michael Butterworth of Etkin Design. Well, hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio, and I'm your host for the show. As always, I'm so excited to have you along. And those of you who are new to the show, boy, you know, we have a lot of episodes and uh, you can find mostly all of those episodes over at keystotheshop.com under episodes. And you can just search for the topic that you're looking for and you're going to come up with a lot of content uh, related to helping you uh, run a thriving retail coffee operation. Um, And so I'd encourage you to do that and also subscribe to the show and that way you'll always get notified when new episodes come out like this one and uh, shift break episodes and specials and the rate of rise roasting series and things like that so hit subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast now keys to the shop is not just a podcast but it's also a consulting and coaching company i've been so thrilled over the past few years here to get to work with dozens upon dozens of coffee professionals and retailers to help them start their business off on the right foot or to help them take their business that's already running to the next level, taking on different projects and problems or challenges and working alongside operators and managers too to enter into a better reality where you don't feel like the business is running you, you're running the business and you have somebody to talk to about a lot of these issues that come up in the normal course of operation. You know, leadership can be a pretty lonely uh, place and Keys to the Shop consulting and coaching helps bring clarity, resolution, and next steps all along the way. So if that sounds interesting to you and you wanna work one-on-one with me at Keys to the Shop Consulting, go ahead and reach out, chris at keystotheshop.com. We'll set up a free discovery call and talk about what you have going on and how Keys to the Shop Consulting can help you. Again, just reach out, chris at keystotheshop.com. Now it's fitting for this episode, especially we're talking about a brewer that is for home use it is a, a brewer to make a lot of coffee. This, we're talking about the Atkin brewer, but um, you know, in the cafe, when we talk about batch brew coffee for a long time, we were really limited in terms of what we could do with batch brew coffee. But that was until the ground control Cyclops brewer came around. The folks over at Voga coffee are amazing. Um, it is a business built from a heart of innovation to create a next level experience of batch brew coffee in the cafe. The award-winning technology allows you to access a huge range of flavors and gives you control over those flavors that other technologies in batch brew coffee just were not giving you. And so it unlocks the potential of the coffee you're serving. And not only is it an amazing batch brewer, but it also makes tea batched iced lattes, batched cold brew, and people all over the world have been exploring the uh, extraction potential of this machine and increasing their profitability and workflow as a result of it. Go visit them at groundcontrol.coffee to learn more. If you want to level up the quality of your batch brew coffee, if you want more workflow efficiency and profitability, you definitely need to consider getting a ground control in your cafe. Again, visit them at groundcontrol.coffee. Now, dependability is absolutely something that uh, people are, well, uh, dependent on. (laughs) When they're customers of your cafe, they expect consistency. And you want to make sure that the products you're using will be consistent, will be quality. And that's why for any kind of plant-based option that you have in your cafe, that I would recommend using the Barista Series from Pacific. The Barista Series is a line of plant-based performance beverages that is designed for baristas and approved by baristas all over the world. So you know that it stands up to the heat from steaming, produces awesome texture for great uh, mouthfeel and latte art, you know, and also keeps the balance of the beverage focused on the coffee. So it's not overwhelming one way or another. Go visit them over at pacificfoodservice.com. Get samples, try it for yourself. I think you're definitely going to be impressed. Again, if you want to serve your customers the best, most dependable product out there in terms of plant-based beverages, you need to be using the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everybody. Today, we are going to be talking with two of the three founders of a company that has brought a large-scale pour-over brewing device to market. A few years ago, Etkin Design was founded between three friends, Michael Butterworth, Aaron O'Neill, and Osgur Jerdan. Uh, We're talking with Michael and Osgur today. Michael Butterworth has a long history in specialty coffee as a trainer, 
uh, as a competitor. He runs a blog called Coffee Compass, as well as having been a Q grader and is still actively an AST certified coach, certified trainer. Michael was actually a previous guest on this show. We were talking about service in the cafe, and so we'll link to that episode here as well. Osgore comes with a long history in the world of English instruction and has been an academic director for ESL services and educational organizations. He is the director of the STEAM workshops and Etkin English in Istanbul, Turkey, and operates as a successful corporate English language consultant. His role in co-founding this company has been instrumental in creating the relationships necessary for the actual creation of the brewer, building the networks in Turkey to bring this to market as this is a Turkish product. And Aaron O'Neill, who is the other co-founder of Etkin Design, is the marketing director and has had a long history as a brand specialist, leader in media, and a retail consultant. And so these three guys come together and create this amazing brewer uh, which I just used for a party not too long ago, and it was really fantastic. So I'm excited to get to talk with Michael and Oscar today about the uh, founding of this company in its unique journey in going from idea to crowdfunding to manufacturing with uh, local products in Istanbul, Turkey, uh, using Turkish porcelain, developing the relationships necessary on the ground to bring it to market, I love the goal of this brewer as it is bringing scale to the pour over process for people who want to entertain at home and be a part of the community that gathers in their home. And so uh, we talk about not only the journey of bringing Atkin as a brand to market and what that means for democratizing innovation, but also we get into hospitality. We get into how we're promoting um, making quality coffee at home and how bringing into our methodology of brewing the values of hospitality is so critical for coffee at large. And so I'm excited to have these guys on the show. I hope you really enjoy it. Here now is my conversation with the co-founders of Etkin Design, Michael Butterworth, and Osgush Jerdan. All right, Michael, Osgush, welcome to Keys to the Shop. How are you guys? Doing well, thank you. Doing great. Yeah, I'm glad to have you on the show. And, um, I, you know, we have a lot of things to talk about related to kind of what brings us together here is the fact that you all have started a company and that is a large scale pour over brewing uh, device that I went through crowdfunding, and I remember, Michael, you bringing me prototypes here in, in Louisville. Uh, must have been a, a two years ago or almost two years ago. You know, I, we're interested in that story, in particular, how it relates to home brewing. What in your careers led to you developing this dripper, and how did, I mean, your paths cross, and how did this dripper come to fruition? Yeah, you know, honestly, Chris, our story begins when uh, Oscar and I were having a cup of coffee together, uh, and this was in 2020. And at the time, I was working for Oscar's business English consulting company. And so we were both consulting at some of the top multinationals in Turkey, uh, mostly helping, you know, executives with their English. And as you can imagine, the pandemic affected that business. And so we had kind of had this uh, business meeting in a coffee shop. It was kind of this brief window where coffee shops were allowed to be open in 2020. Uh, it was a very short window, it turned out. I think maybe it was a month. Uh, and so we kind of had this uh, conversation about how we could try to inject some life into the consulting business. And then just as we were wrapping it up, uh, Oscar asked me, do you have any ideas of something we could do with porcelain? And it caught me off guard. Uh, but it actually it turned out I did have an idea of something we could do with porcelain because I had been kind of tossing around this idea for a coffee dripper for about three months at that point uh, that was really kind of inspired by the long weeks that we had spent locked down in our apartments uh, during the early part of the pandemic. And uh, But it was always just kind of an idea for me. Uh, but Oscar uh, inspired me to kind of see if that idea had any legs. And uh, we got a third friend, Aaron, involved. And I guess the rest is history. Oscar, what was it that led you to say, well, have you thought of anything to do with porcelain? Because I know that there, this is made from Turkish porcelain, right? That's right. That's right. Um, well, uh, obviously, COVID had, uh, uh, had become so widespread in Turkey at that time. The coffee shops were being closed, opened up again. So it, during that brief window when we were meeting, uh, actually right before it, 
I was talking to my wife about, should we stay in Istanbul? <laughs> There's 20 million other people in the city. And maybe with this pandemic, we could just move somewhere else. Um, and there was no end to it. So I considered the town called Kutahya. Uh, it's actually an old Roman name for the city, Kutahya with a Q. Uh, but yeah, the city was, is well known for its porcelain. So we considered it, it's a small town. We could go there and kind of get away from all the rules that they were following in Istanbul. So as we were <laughs> thinking about moving there, I thought they have lots of porcelain. I haven't done anything with it, but surely someone I know might be interested. So that's what I did. I just asked Michael, do you have an idea? And, and he did, thankfully. <laughs> and, and I went over there. I took the uh, designs that we had. I took it to the biggest uh, porcelain company in Turkey. And I said, this is what we have. And they took us seriously and <laughs> rest of it just followed after that. That's interesting. So you, you said they take you, they took you seriously. Did they have typically a lot of people approaching them with ideas or, cause if I, I have the impression that if you tried that in the States or something like a, a giant manufacturer, you, and you say, oh, well, yeah, I have an idea that like, well, get in line, uh, or, or something to that effect. So it, it seems like that, that was really great that they just really took that seriously. What led to that step? Part of it was and my wife uh, made a friend at the park uh, with our kids in Kutahya. And while we were there, uh, the, this woman told my wife that her husband works for this company. Uh, most of the business deals in Turkey happen, even though it's all online and we have caught up the 21st century, but it's still very relational. So through this contact, I get into the company. Uh, they, he helped me set up a meeting. Uh, because it was coming from one of their top engineers, uh, they let me have a meeting with the with one of their uh, U.S. representatives, and that's how I got uh, how I got it going. But because of my job in Istanbul with all these multinational companies, uh, that also added to our credibility. To be honest, there was definitely kind of a lot of uh, fear and trembling in that first uh, meeting on our part. Uh, you know, we walked into it and. This is a company that manufactures things for Ikea. They manufacture things for Starbucks. It's a very large company. And, you know, we were a, a tiny little startup uh, with a little prototype. And I definitely feel like it was out of the ordinary for them to kind of go about things this way. Um, I think they kind of knew that we were new to this, but they were willing to take a chance on us. And we're thankful for that. This is not typically how a um, device like a pour over is uh, you know created or in you know in terms of the fact that you this was crowdfunded and this was just an idea that you had in the back of your mind that eventually you you got to bring to fruition through a prototype and then uh, really this was a crowdfunded like i said effort um, i wonder if you could speak to two things one what's the pitch for this uh dripper and then two how is the journey from bringing it to idea to fruition unique in the industry? So yeah, basically the, the pitch for the product is just that uh, you can make enough to share. Uh, I was looking for a pour over dripper where I can make enough coffee for my wife and I in the morning. Uh, we both drink a lot of coffee, approximately around 700 mils together each morning. And so even though I had half a dozen different pour over drippers, uh, none of them could make a batch large enough without compromising the, the cup quality in some way. Uh, so if you kind of look at SCA standards, the standards is for the, the brew bed. So the depth of the coffee in your um, device, whether it be you know a batch brewer, a large commercial batch brewer, a small home machine, or a pour over dripper, it's actually the same for bed depth. It should be between 2.5 and five centimeters. And so what you try to do is if, you, you know, if you're trying to make a larger batch of coffee in a pour over dripper, that's not really designed for that kind of volume, you end up having way too deep of a bed, which can lead to, you know, the brew choking out or channeling other things happening that really just create kind of a lot of off-putting flavors in your coffee. Your brew times are going way too long. And so I was just kind of frustrated that I couldn't find a pour over dripper where I could make a larger batch of coffee. Uh, there is one very famous, larger pour over dripper, uh, which I won't name by name on the podcast. It's an iconic piece of coffee design, but I found it interesting that many of my friends in the coffee industry 
uh, though they respect this famous device as a, a piece of icon, you know, this iconic piece of design, uh, many of us choose not to brew coffee with it because we're not 100% happy with the way the coffee <laughs> yeah. tastes. Uh, and again, I think that gets back to this kind of geometry issue where at larger volumes, it's really more important to have a flat brew bed so that your bed depth, you know, that, that coffee, uh, that layer of coffee at the bottom of the device, it's the same depth at every part of the slurry. I, I like that uh, idea that this has to be technically correct. It has to produce great coffee because you could have simply created a large format brewer uh, of your own design and whimsy and, and whatever. Um, but because I know your background, Michael, uh, is is in uh, specialty coffee uh, as a AST. I think you're still an AST certified yeah, right. um, instructor. And so you're very familiar with, with these types of things. And uh, it's also the hospitality aspect of it too. So it's technically correct, but also uh, it feels like with pour overs at home, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, right? But a lot of people that are using pour overs at home are using smaller ones. And I know they need to make coffee for their loved ones at home, but it seems like the market is more geared toward single user uh, interfaces, right? Um, so I wonder if y'all could speak to the importance of creating a, uh, an opportunity with this piece of, uh, equipment to bring people together for, for the purpose of hospitality and, and, and sharing good coffee, because it feels like we have a lot of prosumers. There's a lot of, uh, navel gazing in the prosumer industry, and there's not as much access, you know, there's not as much focus on like, let's share all this coffee with all the people we know. Uh, talk to that a little bit. Yeah, I think when Michael first told me about his idea, what was surprising to me was that, that the market wasn't already full of ideas for, for making coffee for lots of people. You know, drinking coffee in our culture is not a single person thing. <laughs> we hardly ever drink coffee just by ourselves. Uh, so... For, for that reason, that's why I jumped on the idea. When he told me about this, it kind of excited me. It was like, we could bring people together with, uh, with uh, coffee. Uh, and, and, it, and it wasn't being done, as, at least as widely as I assumed, uh, to be honest. I don't have a background in coffee. I'm a tea person. I was a tea person uh, who became a coffee person through my life. But yeah, that was a surprising thing for me, that, that coffee was not being made to... Uh, bring people together, at least in this format, uh, through a pour over. Um, and hearing Michael's story with his wife and every morning, him having to make two, uh, two pour overs uh, so that they could have coffee together. And I'm just imagining, mm. so you make one and then it gets kind of cold <laughs> and then yours is ready. But you can never really enjoy it together. And that just defeated the whole purpose of drinking a beverage together. <laughs> um, we, we couldn't get the same quality of coffee at the same time. Um, so that's why, that's how I see it, with the, the hospitality aspect of things. Yeah, we had a really great experience recently where I was actually staying over at Oscar's house and they, he had some other guests there as well. And, and in Turkey, there's this really beautiful kind of breakfast tradition uh, where the table is just covered in all these different dishes. Uh, you know, kind of family style where everyone is, you know, uh, picking and choosing uh, from all these different dishes on the table. And, and, you know, traditionally you would be drinking Turkish tea at breakfast. But if you go further back, actually, uh, to the kind of the more Ottoman tradition, uh, it was originally coffee. And so this was a great opportunity to kind of use our own product and just brew a liter of coffee. And everyone at that breakfast table got a fresh, you know, cup of pour over coffee at the same time. And it was really kind of a beautiful moment for us to really just sit and enjoy uh, our own product. I like that. And you and, and Osgur both brought that up, that up is the idea that um, you get to the, as the brewer, whoever is the designated brewer, right, is, is still able to participate <laughs> in the drinking of coffee and not just busy with dishes. It's like, I don't really want to be a home barista, literally, <laughs> you know, which is <laughs> all about the side work and the dishes and, and things like that. You you want to be with your people you're making the coffee for. Yeah, can we skip to the good part, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so 
when I, I want to talk about the um, crowdfunding and then the the idea that you kind of circumvented the normal channels for delivering a professional pour over device to the market in, in a way, right? Through doing the crowdfunding. Um, talk a little bit about how that's something that is kind of ramping up in the industry and how that could change the way that we make a difference with coffee quality or accessibility and that kind of thing. Uh, so very early on, we were kind of faced with the decision. We had this idea for a product and uh, should we, you know, try to raise money, you know, maybe from like a venture capital firm? Should we try to get a loan? Uh, you know, could we try to bootstrap this or should we do crowdfunding? Then uh, we found out that the mold fee uh, to make the dripper was going to be 10,000 euro. And so we quickly decided we needed to do some crowdfunding <laughs> to help us, you know, uh, mitigate some of the risk of having this thing made, you know, so that was kind of 10,000 euro up front just to really find out if we even had a viable project uh, product. Uh, so, you know, I think the beautiful thing about crowdfunding though is that it gives you know people like us you know you know my background most of my professional career i've been a barista trainer uh i've only ever worked for small and medium-sized companies uh and so you know if, if we kind of tried to go through conventional channels of getting this product made you know i'm not even sure how we could have done that to be honest uh but that's the beauty of crowdfunding is to able to you know, really kind of tap into our networks that each of us had uh, for the three partners who started the company. And then, you know, at some point the algorithm takes over and you start getting uh, people that you've never heard of uh, back in your project. I think for, for each of us, that was an exciting moment. The first time we saw a backer came in where, you know, we're asking each other, do you know this person? Do you know this person? No, I've never heard of them. And, you know, that was a really uh, beautiful moment to realize that our product was reaching, um, people that, you know, that we didn't know. So you have a problem to solve and you set out to solve it. You put it out there, people support it. And now it's a thing very easy, but you know, when it comes to innovation in the industry, a lot of us look to the, um, larger companies that already have a foothold to tweak what they're currently doing, uh, in order to cater to our desires. But it feels like there's a lot more to overcome when it cut not only just logistically, but you wouldn't just say, okay, a few people have told us at the, you know, maybe a large grinder company, a few baristas told us that they really want this feature. Okay, let's do it. You're not just going to say that, right? There's a lot more resistance because you'd have to feel this groundswell of demand from busy people. People just don't have the time to band themselves together and make these demands. And so progress can sometimes be kind of slow for larger companies if they're not really tuned in. So I, I, so that's a really interesting aspect of this that kind of democratizes innovation. Absolutely. You know, when we um, first got that minimum order size from the factory, you know, at 5,000 units, which for us just seemed like an astronomical number, you know, but if you're talking about a legacy company, you know, that are making the products that we all know and love, you know, that's just a drop in the bucket. It's just one shipping container. You know, they're, they're moving containers upon containers. Uh, and so you, you would never dream of developing a new product just to do one shipping container of it. Uh, and of course, that wasn't, that wasn't our intent either. But, you know, in the very least, that's where we could start. Um, and crowdfunding allowed us to do that. Uh, and the other important thing, too, is that it kind of it gave us proof of concept. Uh, because this idea of a larger flatbed dripper, uh, we couldn't find it. You know, I'm sure as soon as I say that we were the first, someone's going to dig somebody up. <laughs> you know, so I'll never say we're the first, but I haven't seen another one. I'll put it that way. And so, uh, you know, I'm sorry, that's not true. I've seen one other one. <laughs> but uh, but still, it's not like a really uh, a really popular uh, kind of product category. In fact, I would say it's a product category that doesn't really exist. Uh, when you know, we kind of like pitched it to some different people, you know, the first few people that heard about it, they even had kind of trouble wrapping their head around the kind of value proposition. And so what the Kickstarter campaign and followed by Indiegogo campaign allowed us to do 
is to be able to sh show that there's actually hundreds of people. Okay, yeah, some of them friends and family, but many of them complete strangers. Like there's hundreds of people who kind of resonate with this idea of making enough coffee to share, but doing it by hand. So that's great. And the proof of concept rolling in from actual you know, pe uh, people that have a demand for this, that you put words to their thoughts or, or the things that they didn't know how to art articulate. But the gap in the industry is that pour overs were made as a anti batch brew kind sure. of, you know, they were uh, individual cups. It's more craft. It's more specialty. It's what you should be doing. It's very we were uh, reflexive on that in the industry. You know, there's just like middle ground of saying, no, you can make a lot of coffee with still doing pour over. So that's pretty cool. Um, I wonder if you all could speak a little bit to, you know, you're not manufacturers. You're not like, you don't have a sales product sales background necessarily. Um, and so this is a venture that there's going to be a lot of learning curve, I imagine during the invention and distribution and marketing and all this other stuff. Um, Osgur, I think we'll you know start with you. Like, what is it about this process that has been the, the biggest challenge and how have you grown the most as a, uh, I will say business person as you've uh, you launched this product? For me, I've been really uh, blessed by uh, having mentors around us who might not know exactly about the coffee industry, but they are very familiar with the uh, production manufacturing end of things. So we have been just really encouraged to have these people close by uh, that we can ask and get feedback from. Uh, but I think I have been very involved in the, the factory end of things, <laughs> going and visiting the factory once a month, getting to know these people and learning about uh, how uh, to communicate what we wanted. Uh, since they are such a large manufacturer, they just, you know, they have a way of doing things. <laughs> and, and in some, uh, in some areas they had, they, felt freedom to add or take away things and we had to step <laughs> in and keep it our own product you know before it, it changed shape um, so that was a, a I think a, a big challenge for on my end my responsibilities uh, communicating with the factory what do we want how do we want it and and how to to communicate these expectations to our to, to the factory so that was a the I think a great challenge for us but I think we have overcome because Again, being in a, such a relational context, uh, it's all about relationship. If we can keep our relationship healthy, then we will figure it out. You know, if we, we just got to stick around long enough to, to, to argue over designs and uh, what we would like change, all these things, uh, it worked itself out eventually. But that's, uh, we went through a lot of uh, designs and uh, tests, let's say. Well, on that note, I was, uh, you know, as a follow up to that, you know, your first protest of the design with them, I imagine was there was a little trepidation, you know, going in and saying like, uh, not quite what we want. Um, and now, exactly. you know, I imagine there's a lot more freedom because of that relationship to to speak to that. There's so maybe a, some mutual respect. I mean, how how would you say your approach to interacting with the factory uh has been informed over time like um versus interacting with people who are using the product because it's a it seems like it's just a different culture when you're operating within that that closed system of uh, a facility like a like the factory yeah i, I believe in the beginning <laughs> I, they didn't know us uh, even though we have a great contact a, a mutual friend uh, but they didn't know who we were if, if you were actually gonna do if you carry the, this all the way uh, to fruition so uh, i think after we made our first order transferred the funds to their account they realized how serious we were and that they mm. enabled us to get a little closer uh, they invited in some of their higher up management came into our meetings uh, and we told stories about our families and that really uh, brought us together and when they found out that i was living in the city uh, most of their clients of course fly in or drive into the city it's a smaller town uh, maybe a 20th maybe 40th of the size of istanbul so very small town and so for me to be living there it uh, kind of opened up lots of doors for us um, I think communication is a is not done over emails and messages in Turkey, uh, especially in a factory. It's a it's a family-owned business, 
There are two big companies in Turkey for porcelain, and they're actually siblings own them. <laughs> it's the same family that uh. owns most of the market. And they just love to do face-to-face -face communication. Whenever I even message them on WhatsApp or email them, they always ask, when are you going to come again? <laughs> We'd love to see you. Uh, so I think that uh, as a millennial, it, it's very difficult for me, but I have to do a lot more phone calls and do face-to-face -face visits, uh, drive four hours uh, one way to, to visit them in the factory to show that I, I'm, we are still invested. We still care about uh, our relationship. That's so great. That was also a new thing for us. <laughs> and that's what we discovered pretty quickly. If you have a Kickstarter campaign and it meets its funding goal, you're going to get bombarded with emails from factories all over the world, mostly in East Asia. And, you know, to be honest, we could have had this stripper been made for a lot cheaper elsewhere. But for us, it was really important to have that relationship. It was important to have that kind of two-way conversation where we're not just sending um, emails to each other or using Google Translate. You know, we're talking to each other uh, in Turkish over cups of Turkish tea or sometimes coffee that we would brew. Uh, but that relational aspect for us, we really feel like it's important on both ends. It's important with our suppliers and it's important with our end users as well. So then, Michael, how were people rea reacting to this dripper in the market that you're targeting? Um, I know that, uh, you know, there could be, was it all positive? Was there just a lot of different kinds of questions? What was, what was the kind of, what was the response that you got from the market as you displayed the dripper and brought it around and showed people? Yeah, one thing that we discovered pretty quickly was that there was a market for it. Uh, even in the, before we had even named the, the company, uh, we were really blessed to work with a guy named Brian Malcolm, who is our partner, Aaron's brother-in-law. And he, uh, full, his full-time job is helping uh, brands uh, really kind of um, articulate their identity. Uh, so he's a brand consultant. And before we had even picked a name for our company, uh, he was, just listening to us, he wanted to understand the product. And at the end of that first meeting, he was all like, I think I might be your first customer because our value proposition resonated. <laughs> I think where we've reached more kind of skepticism is actually within the specialty coffee industry. You know, the, the sector that I've spent more than a decade in, I think because it's such, because there aren't a lot of new products that really come along, uh, certainly not in the pour over dripper space. Uh, so to come in with kind of a new product category, we were met, uh, you know, with a little skepticism maybe, but for me, one of the kind of great moments was I got to brew some coffee with that can dripper for a friend of mine who had made it pretty clear. He didn't think it was a viable product. Uh, when we brewed the coffee together and he tasted it and he was like, that's pretty good. <laughs> like, you know, the, in, in the end, the cup quality <laughs> won him over. And for me, that was really this great kind of moment of vindication where someone who was going into the experience skeptical whether or not we need a larger pour over dripper was able to see the value by the end of, you know, brewing a batch of coffee together. So in terms of specialty coffee, we all have a lot of skepticism, I think, because, you know, like you said, do we need another uh, dripper? There's a, there's a glut of pour overs on lot. the market you know, you could choose from shapes. Yeah, there's a lot. And so you're, you had an uphill battle to fight there. Um, and it, it seems to me that there's a bit of a move in specialty coffee, especially just recently with the SCA coming out with their attributes based definition of specialty, kind of a, a reorganization of, of what the metrics of, of specialty coffee are. Um, Creating more accessibility to specialty coffee has been on the lips of many, many people in, in the industry. It, that is reflected with, you know, more developed coffees, a lot more blends from third wave coffee companies. And, you know, I would say your dripper fits in there because it, it, it encourages that communal aspect of things. But then, you know, specialty has a lot of technical focus in the home brewing market especially there there can be like 17 steps between you and your cup of coffee 
Um, so I guess the question I have is, what do you think about the increased technical emphasis on home brewing? Um, is is home brewing coffee now too complex, or is that complexity necessary, and is it good for coffee? To be honest, if you look at most of the growth that I've seen over the last few years, you know, it's been capsules, it's been ready to drink, it's been instant. You know, and so I think that really the the specialty industry has really been focused on trying to make coffee easier for people and making it more approachable and convenient. And believe me, I, I respect that and I enjoy many of those products, so I'm not against them. But on the same hand, you know, I, I wonder if there isn't a danger that the, the, the more that we just try to make specialty coffee more convenient, the, the, the more that we make it easier if we don't lose some of what makes it special, right? And at the end of the day, uh, if I can make a cup of specialty instant and have it be a pretty decent cup of coffee, I mean, there are times that I'm going to, you know, reach for that capsule or, or, or whatever it is. But you can't tell me it's the same experience as grinding your own coffee, brewing your own coffee, you know, those aromas that come, you know, you know, wafting up uh, when, when you right. start blooming and you're watching the bloom. And, you know, that, that's an experience. Uh, it, it's not just a beverage. And, you know, it's not just a consumable. And so I think that's really what our brand is about, is creating these shared experiences with people. And uh, is there a bit of a learning curve? Yes. You know, that, that's, that's a fact. I've spent the last 10 years teaching people how to make coffee, uh, both you know, in the SCA um, coffee skills program, and also previously at my job working for Quills Coffee in Louisville, Kentucky, you know, I can confidently say I've taught hundreds of baristas how to make coffee. But uh, even if there is a bit of a learning curve, it's actually surprisingly easy to make a great cup of coffee at home. Uh, and I think uh, Oscar here is actually proof of that. Because when we started this product project, uh, I don't think he had ever made a pour over before. But now he's uh, he's something of an expert. What would you say, Oskush? <laughs> expert. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, wouldn't call myself that, but I agree. I mean, uh, watching Michael um, and and Aaron, and just not necessarily explain to me the product, just watching them do it uh, has kind of won me over. And and the the time, the I think the the interaction that we have while we are making the, the while they were making the coffee also won me over um, um, yeah so I totally agree I think Michael just answering the same question but in a way maybe I maybe disagree with you a little bit on this but I do think that there are uh, some of these uh, channels and uh, Instagram accounts that I follow and there are just a lot of new gadgets and little things that are coming out and and even though I, I love doing pour over, some of these little gadgets and these others must have the stuff that are coming out. And if I uh, take these, if I buy these things and if I try to put them in, in our kitchen, I think my wife is not going to be so happy. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that part to keeping it simple, but not really uh, trying to shortcut the whole thing and, and get, get yourself an instant cup of coffee. I think there's that beautiful balance that can win over more of the public uh, but for myself when i when i'm looking out some or looking from the outside i get scared I'm like, what do i buy and every year there are these almost the same looking thing but a little different is coming out but this is why i love the our product why i love etkin as a customer even because i can make lots of good uh, lots of coffee and uh, good quality coffee to share with my friends and I don't have five other products that, that would go in between, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, that's my take on it. But yeah, I do agree. It's just uh, there's a lot that's coming out that other little gadgets that kind of scare me away as a <laughs> as a customer. You know, it's interesting. There might be a few different kinds of customers. The customers who want to reach a particular um, end point in their curiosity about what they should use and then if it works it works for 10 20 years in their house they're they're just going to use it it in and, and there are lots of people like that uh and, the, and if they find a coffee that they love they'll drink that coffee the rest of their life um and i i like those kinds of customers because those are very stable 
But then there's the other kind of customer that I think the um, is the tourist, basically, of specialty coffee that goes and buys 18 different brew methods and 18 different coffees, little bits at a time from all over the world and dibble, you know, they dabble in all of these little things. And so you have to wonder which one is, is better for coffee, which one's better for specialty. Is it <laughs> the long-term stable kind of, uh, of customer that is actually searching for something that works for them and will stick to it or somebody who will just kind of always buy the new thing it never quite arrive at a place mm. where you, because for them that that coffee it's not so much about what the coffee facilitates for them the coffee is the point like the the gadgets are the point not the sharing of coffee with friends or anything like that it's just the exploration of coffee as an individual true a friend of mine told me uh, chris something like that he's he right after i told him about the Atkin dripper he jumped in it was like, I have all these drippers. I would love to buy yours. I was like, okay, uh, which one will you use? Uh, I think as a product, as a, a company, of course we would love people to buy our product, but we'll also, uh, I think it's more, it's very as important for us that they use the product regularly. And it's not just a, something that looks beautiful, but it's used. <laughs> yeah, but I do have to say that we are thankful for those coffee nerds, those Enneagram sevens of the world who are buying every new product because they're the <laughs> ones taking a chance on us. You know, it is a new product. It's a new product category. Uh, it's a new brand name, you know, and so, uh, you know, I had a bit of a personal following uh, from my uh, coffee website that I've been running for years, the coffeecompass.com. But for the most part, you know, we're completely unknown players. And so you have to be, you know, a little bit, of uh, kind of one of these coffee tourists, I guess, to take a chance on our dripper. And so we're thankful for the ones uh, who have taken a chance on it so far. Oh yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And um, it feels like, like I said, the tide is shifting maybe uh, in a way that allows for us to uh, give ourselves permission to work a little bit at specialty coffee and be okay with that. Like you were saying, Michael, um, the experience of making coffee versus putting a packet in hot water, they don't really compare. And I would agree with that. There's, there's something magical. That's why people go to coffee shops too. Absolutely. There's something that transcends, you know, you can make coffee at home. Uh, yeah, but you go to a coffee shop because there's something else there. And what, you know, whether you can articulate that or not might not even matter, but um, you know, having something to rely on, and that that speaks to something deeper than simply caffeine delivery <laughs> or, or something that's just like, oh, this is actually not bad, which is, you know, oftentimes the way that I describe things that I find are really convenience focused items like, oh, I can't believe it's not bad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 100%. So there's a big difference between that and, and really great and good. Um, so I'm interested in, you know, your advice to people who want to maximize their own enjoyment of coffee as well as the enjoyment that uh, they allow for others to have of coffee because it, it feels like when we talk about reaching people for coffee we, we assume it's going to be coffee brands it's going to be baristas in the coffee shop it's going to be professionals but if you've got people making coffee for their friends and family at home and at gatherings it might just be just people making coffee in their kitchens and and they might have more influence in fact than those of us who are uh, quote unquote coffee professionals so what advice or encouragement again would you give to those people who really want to um you know do well in you know serving people great coffee at home yeah i love that you said that chris uh you know when you do a kickstarter campaign uh, and your product finally reaches your warehouse, and then you have to send out hundreds and hundreds of boxes at the same time. Uh, it's, it can be a very terrifying experience. So you you know, for for all these people to get your product at the same time, and you're wondering what the reaction is going to be. Uh, but a story that happened the very first week that our Kickstarter backers received their drippers. One of one of the backers um, took the. The, his dripper into his office 
Uh, he's not a coffee professional. He just enjoys making coffee at home. But he took the dripper uh, into the office, made coffee for his colleagues kind of just in the break room. And one of them ordered a dripper on the spot after kind of sharing that experience uh, together. And for us, that was such a beautiful moment to see that people really were resonating, uh, not just with the idea, but the actual kind of execution. Uh, you know, in terms of tips for how can you enjoy better coffee at home, uh, my the most important one by far um, is simply to follow a recipe. You know, like this, this seems uh, so basic, but it's so fundamental. Uh, when, we, when we teach uh, the SCA courses on brewing coffee, we teach the, the seven essential elements of, uh, of brewing coffee. And the first one is your uh, water to coffee ratio. And there's a reason why it's the first one. It's because that, that recipe that you use, the amount of coffee that you use, and the amount of water that you use really determines the possible strengths and the possible extractions that you can get. And if that sounds like just a bunch of like uh, scientific mumbo jumbo, don't worry about it. It just means that if you use the right amount of coffee and you use the right amount of water, your finished result is probably going to be pretty good. You're like 80% of the way there. After you have the right amount of coffee and the right amount of water, we can start worrying about the grind size. We can start worrying about your pouring technique. We can start worrying about your water temperature. Like if you're, if you want to get nerdy about it, you can tweak all of those things and it's a lot of fun. But if you just want a good cup of coffee and you just start with using the right amount and the, of coffee, the right amount of water, like 90% of the time, you're going to have a cup that is good. Um, and, and to be honest, you know, when, when I go into a coffee shop, if I get served a cup of coffee that isn't that great, I would say 90% of the time it's because there was a mistake made here. You know, it wasn't one of the other variables. Uh, so, you know, the easiest way to do that is to get a cheap gram scale. You know, I think my first uh, kitchen scale I ever got, I got it at Walmart for like $12. And that lasted me for years until I dropped it on the floor and it shattered into a million pieces. Then I invested into, you know, a proper coffee scale that had a built-in timer and some of those other nice features. But, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy. Kitchen scale, use the right amount of coffee, use the right amount of water, and you're going to have a pretty decent cup. No, those, that's all really good information. And, you know, as you hear those things, you know, obviously if you're a coffee shop, you should probably be, you know, s selling those things in your cafe, right? Those implements that allow people to brew great coffee at home, brew your coffee, especially if you're a roaster. Um, that's your job is to help facilitate people's success with your coffee at home um, when they buy the whole bean, right? And so that's, that's really good information. And, uh, sticking to the recipe, especially uh, like just tweaking one recipe, there's so many recipes out there for coffee from professionals all over the world. Um, it's daunting to really zero in on, on one and know that it, you know, you, you can kind of get second guess yourself because, uh, this person's a champion. I don't like the way it tastes. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm the one who's wrong because they're a champion. Um, uh, it may be a little bit more confidence in, in your taste as the uh, arbiter of what is great, according to a, a recipe that you tweak a little bit here and there to your to your taste. Uh, that seems pretty straightforward to me. Um, Oscar, I, I'm interested in your perspective on this because in specialty coffee, we reach out to consumers and as a uh, tea drinker and now pour over uh, aficionado <laughs> yourself. Um, I, I'm thinking that there is a, there's a way to interact with people who are outside of the coffee industry. And I'm curious what you would like to see. How would you uh, recommend, uh, specialty coffee retailers and people who are in really direct contact with consumers interact with them in a way that truly does make coffee more accessible, exciting, and, you know, simple to enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I really appreciate what Michael said, uh, when he talked about the, the, here are the two things that are very important and these other things can be great. We'll make the coffee taste better, but here are the, the here are the two things that we need to start with. Um, most of the time when I, hear coffee people talk. Uh, I don't get that, that simple explanation. That doesn't give me uh, uh, that courage to attempt something. And I think that's the that's a big 
um, uh, step, I believe, that the coffee um, roasters, just the, the coffee lovers who are uh, producing and selling uh, can do. Simplify some of these things and focus on the, the, the activity itself. As we were just talking about, why, why Purovo? Then we can have these machines make the coffee or instant coffee. Well, it's about the experience and it's about I'm doing something by, with my hands for you, for, to share with people. Um, I think if you can focus on the experience a little bit more and, and what is communicating to the people around us, I think more people will attend. Instead of, here's the perfect cup of coffee and try to get to it, good luck, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and here's the, I'm the uh, barista champion and I'm doing it. Look how easy it is. And you attempt it and it doesn't taste the same or look the same. Uh, and you get discouraged. I think um, that's where Michael won me over with this idea. Was I attempted it, and it wasn't just like Michael's, but it was much better than what I was drinking before, and that was good enough. And it kind of kept me going. I think uh, working uh, on an explanation based on minimum, what we need to do, and how to make it better uh, is a great uh, way to go forward. Yeah, great. And the sooner you can do that, the sooner you can enjoy coffee with friends. Exactly. Etkin means effective in Turkish, and that's kind of our key driver for our company. We want to make products that are effective, that make a really great cup of coffee, and but are also a joy to use. Well, I want to thank you both for being on the show. It's been fun to talk with you, and uh, huge congratulations for the success of this launch, and um, really exciting to see. Where can people go to learn more about Etkin? Yeah, so our website is etkincoffee.com. Uh, so yeah, that's the best place to go. We're also on Instagram. Our Instagram is Etkin Design, uh, but those are great places where they can watch brewing tutorials, read blog posts, and of course, buy a dripper if you're so inclined. Awesome. Well, thank you both for being here on the show. I really appreciate uh, what you're doing and uh, spending time with us today. Yeah, thank you, Chris. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here. And uh, we love your podcast. Please uh, keep it up. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Okay, everyone. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that episode. Uh, one of the things that I really appreciate about this story is, you know, we can get really trapped in this bubble in specialty coffee where our obsession starts to build a, uh, a, a wall where people who just want a simple good cup of coffee feel they have to jump through a bunch of hoops. I think the philosophy behind this brewer and just in general making coffee at home for friends that gather together is that we want to enjoy it with them and we want to make sure that the coffee brewing process is not so precious as to disallow people from enjoying it with company and just being in the moment and so i hope that that's one of the things that you took away from this at least that's something that i really love about this conversation plus i think we'll always have a soft spot in our hearts for things that involve craft and also uh, a certain ritual. Pour over coffee has stood the test of time. We have all sorts of convenience options out there that have their niche somewhere in the industry, but creating uh, a special batch of coffee at home for you and your guests will always be something that is part of how we understand specialty coffee. And so a huge thank you to Michael and Osgur for joining me on the show. If you want more information and want to check this brewer out for yourself, go to the website etkincoffee.com. That's E-T-K-I-N coffee.com. And you can also follow them on Instagram at etkindesign. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, as always, you can reach out to me, Chris, at Keys to the Shop. And that's also where you can reach out if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching or consultation for you in your coffee shop, uh, either to start off on the right foot or to refine your operations and problem solve some things that are happening in your cafe, go ahead and reach out chris at keystotheshop.com. Also, don't forget that coming up in 2023 is a new round of Coffee Fest trade shows. I'm going to be at all of these shows. There's New York, there's Louisville, Kentucky, which that's right in my backyard. So I'm super excited about that one. We also have Anaheim, California, and yet to be announced, a fourth 
show coming in the fall. And so you want to stay tuned to coffeefest.com for where that's going to be. But there's plenty of opportunity for you to go to this trade show. It's just more than a trade show. For 30 years, Coffee Fest has been a hub of resourcing and equipping coffee retailers to build great and profitable thriving businesses through free or accessibly priced trainings, workshops, lectures, panel discussions, just presentations of information across a spectrum of different topics that will absolutely give you the resources to do well in your coffee bar. There's also competitions like Best Cold Brew. There's the Coffee Fest Latte Art World Championship Open that I'm a head judge for. And of course, there's a trade show there, you know, you can interact with vendors who supply your coffee shop with amazing products and equipment in person, ask them all the questions you need to. That's awesome. As well as the community of coffee parties and people all of the same mind. We want awesome coffee and want to have fun doing it and want to be successful doing it. So Coffee Fest is the place to go. Check them out at coffeefest.com. Use the code KEYS, K-E-Y-S, to get 50% off your registration when you register for 2023 shows. Again, that's KEYS. The code KEYS gives you 50% off your registration when you and your team sign up. Uh, and I hope to see you there. Again, that is at coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our show today, everyone. I really appreciate you joining me. Don't forget to subscribe to Keys to the Shop. Absolutely, please, please share these episodes. Share Keys to the Shop with people uh, that you think could use this information. And just put it out there on your social media. That would be so helpful. I appreciate all of you. Have an awesome day. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you Keys to the Shop. <laughs>